200 years ago, uh, Jefferson was nearing the, uh, the end of his presidency, and in about three weeks, he would return home to Monticello to forge ahead with the dream of building a university, and a university based on the uh, academical village concept that you're all familiar with, um, under which learning's a lifelong and shared experience between uh, students and professors. And that um, dream and that process obviously continues here on the grounds um, of, uh, of the university today. The university is very well uh, connected internationally. Uh, Universitas 21, which is a worldwide collaboration of 21 universities, includes four of our top universities, but only one American university, UVA, and it's chaired by your own president, uh, President Castine, who is away at the moment uh, in Singapore um, uh, in that capacity. Um, Jefferson's University, this university, was the first to offer many courses that are now standard, including uh, astronomy, botany, philosophy, political science, um, and it's interesting to ponder what courses uh, Jefferson, the, the polymath, would, um, would choose to teach if he were alive um, today. And we all recall uh, that comment of President Kennedy's in 1962 when he welcomed 49 um, Nobel Prize winners to the White House, and he said, I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent and of human knowledge that's ever been gathered together at the White House, with the possible ex exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Um, now, um, the rotunda, this rotunda um, was the centerpiece of Jefferson's dream, um, and it's a huge personal privilege for me to be um, here and to speak to you today and to um, accept the university's invitation. I'm not sure your founder would have been wholly pleased uh, with my presence, um, and I think he would have found it um, uh, ironic that, um, that the Queen uh, visited the university uh, in the year of the United States' bicentennial celebration, um, how many years ago, 32 years ago, 33 years ago. Um, Jefferson, for understandable reasons, um, had um, uh, not a huge amount of affection uh, for the UK, at least for the UK government and for our uh, style of politics. And given the times that he lived through and shaped, um, that's not surprising. But late in life, uh, he wrote that no two nations on earth can be so helpful to each other as friends, nor so hurtful as enemies. And I hope Jefferson would be pleased that the modern form of our relationship has been close and cooperative. And it's based on a special blend of uh, shared values and shared interests, the habit of working closely together in peace and war, of always talking frankly to each other about the world's problems. Um, it's based on a willingness to make shared sacrifices to defend what we believe in. And it's that close and deep relationship that we're now renewing as the Obama administration takes the reins, uh, and as we, together with our other international partners, uh, share the responsibility for handling the world's many problems. Now, I want to look today at just three specific areas, case studies um, of opportunity. Uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan first, then the Middle East peace process, and finally, climate change. On Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, Jefferson wrote to Monroe, uh, our first and fundamental maxim should be never to entangle ourselves in the broils of Europe. Now, what would he have thought of, uh, of the United States entangling itself in the broils uh, of South Asia? Um, today's world, our world, is of course hugely different from Jefferson's. Globalization, multilateralism, values-based uh, alliances are fundamental features um, of the environment, the complex environment, that today's leaders operate in. And Afghanistan and Pakistan are at the top of America's foreign policy agenda and Britain's for very good reasons. After 9-11, the international community toppled the Taliban regime and vowed to ensure that Afghanistan would not again be a haven for terrorists. And since then, there have been many improvements, more schools, more roads, more hospitals, more opportunities for women. But there's a huge challenge for us, which is to create the conditions on which those improvements can be sustained, and it won't be easy. Uh, we've seen over the past year that violence is escalating, governance is uh, at best patchy, <coughs> corruption is rife, the Afghan government's capacity at all levels remains weak, and people are losing confidence both in uh, the foreign forces and in their own government. 
So um, we need to think how we turn this situation round. First of all, um, we need some clear and attainable objectives, uh, not um, Jeffersonian democracy in the, in the subcontinent, um, but we need enough, um, uh, enough to achieve our valid security goals. Secondly, we need um, an effective counterinsurgency strategy. And when you're talking about counterinsurgency, you mean, it means you have to think politically as much as militarily, and you need to combine all the elements of power, both civilian and military. Um, we need also to work towards empowering Afghan institutions. And that means not just the Afghan security forces, but also their civil service, their judges, their courts. And we must work with the grain of Afghan society, a tribal society, which means building up a strong local capacity. Because ultimately, those Afghan institutions are our exit strategy. Now, there's a NATO summit uh, in April, which your president will attend, uh, which takes place in both France and Germany, and it will be a chance for the international community to come together around uh, a vision for success uh, in Afghanistan. Now, we expect the new administration to announce an increase in uh, American resources for Afghanistan. And we also expect them to ask the international community to increase our, its uh, contribution too. And we, the UK, strongly support increased burden sharing in Afghanistan. We are the second largest contributor by quite a long way in both the military and civilian areas. And we've called on others in the alliance to do more. But we believe that additional troops, uh, though welcome, especially if they come without uh, caveats on their use, they can't be the only answer. European countries should not assume that if they can't contribute combat forces, they can't contribute anything. Afghan, uh, the Afghan needs uh, go much wider, police trainers, financial support, uh, civilian capacity building and aid at the local level. So Europe in all those areas is well placed to help. And we need to look at Afghanistan in its regional context. Too often, uh, Afghanistan's neighbors have conspired to keep it weak and unstable. Pakistan, India, and Iran should all have an interest in a stable Afghanistan, which is not the world capital of the opium trade or a haven for terrorists. Now, of all uh, Afghanistan's neighbors, Pakistan is the key. And there's no solution in Afghanistan without uh, addressing the problems on the other side of the border. For too long, Pakistan has been fixated on the threat from India. Its military has been structured around defense against India, and extremist groups working uh, against India have operated from within Pakistan. Increasingly, people in Pakistan realize that the real threat to its survival today is from the Taliban and from other extremists. So we support Pakistan's uh, new civilian government in tackling terrorism. That doesn't just mean going after terrorists militarily, it also means contributing visibly to building a sustainable future for the border regions. The tribal areas along the Afghan-Pakistan border are the most likely origin for another terrorist attack against the West, and it's going to take sustained commitment uh, along a number of lines and for a number of years to change that. Now, on the Middle East peace process, um, and specifically the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict, uh, it's clear that Europe and the United States will need to work in partnership if we're going to help resolve it. I say help because, of course, it's for the parties themselves, ultimately, to agree a deal. But past experience shows that they'll need a lot of help from the international community, be it financial, security, or political, to close the deal. The most immediate issue is Gaza. We watched last month's armed confrontation with grave concern for the people of Israel, who were facing daily rocket attacks, and, of course, for the people of Gaza themselves. And we've got to help the residents of Gaza in such a way that we strengthen uh, decent, law-abiding leaders on the Palestinian side, such as Prime Minister Fayyad and President Abbas, who are trying to deliver peace for all Palestinians. Uh, what we want is a comprehensive peace with an independent Palestine and a secure Israel at its core. But that's going to need to be underpinned by a uh, wider peace between Israel and the entire Arab world. And rather than a two-state solution, we are actually looking 
for a 23-state solution, one involving Israel and the 22 members of the Arab League. And the support of the Arab world is going to be crucial if Palestinian leaders are to negotiate a deal and rein in those who would seek to derail the process. Now, the contours of this deal have been known for some time. Uh, a return to the 1967 borders with limited land swaps, a compromise on the right of return for Palestinian refugees, and a solution on Jerusalem. But that hasn't made the decisions any easier to take. We've been close to agreement uh, a number of times. For example, the parameters that were set out by President Clinton or the discussions that went on following the Annapolis meeting here over the last year or so. But we've never got close enough. And difficult decisions, as, I, as I've said, require support, both political and practical. Now, the, the political support which the United States and Europe uh, give can be seen in the appointment of Senator Mitchell as the administration's special envoy, and Tony Blair as the representation of the wider, uh, as a representative of the wider international community, the quartet. It can be seen in President Obama's early phone calls to Middle Eastern leaders. I think the first person he telephoned on entering the, um, on entering the Oval Office was President Mubarak of Egypt. And in, and in his decision to give his first television interview to an Arab uh, um, television channel. And it comes in the very welcome signal from the new administration that despite pressing domestic issues, um, the president is going to work from the outset on this issue. And that's uh, what we believe is essential because we see this as a, as a transcendent issue in international relations. The practical support from Europe and from America comes in various forms. Security training for Palestinian forces, uh, work to build up the economy of the West Bank to show the Palestinian public that there is a real peace dividend at hand, the support the European Union is giving to Palestinian institutions so that they can, in due course, support a fully functioning Palestinian state, um, and the readiness which the UK and other Europeans show in tackling the smuggling of weapons into Gaza, um, which, uh, uh, if we're able to help that, would, um, would uh, alleviate Israel's security problems. The last um, case study I wanted to mention is climate change. It's a very different sort of issue, um, but uh, um, a very important one. Uh, the UK's view for some years, as you know, has been very clear that we need to move urgently to a new um, low-carbon economy. The science on this, we've said for many years, uh, has been unequivocal. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change forecasts global warming of 3 to 10 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. The economic and humanitarian consequences of this scenario would be catastrophic for every country. So based on the science, we believe that we need to restrict global warming to no more than two degrees Celsius to avoid that happening. So I want to say a bit about climate security, about economic security, and, um, and the issue of energy security as well. On climate security, rising sea levels are already endangering vulnerable populations in low-lying areas like Bangladesh. Other equally challenging climate risks include uh, increased food scarcity as agriculture is damaged, particularly in the poorest countries, water scarcity, including through massive loss of glacial melt, and resource shortages, including deforestation. And Europe and America are by no means immune. Uh, we in Europe suffered an unprecedented number of deaths from the heat wave uh, in 2003. And in the United States, we've witnessed the increased um, frequency and severity of extreme weather. Here in Virginia, your Climate Change Commission highlights the risk of serious and growing threats to Virginia's roads, railways, ports, utility systems, and other critical infrastructure. The second problem is economic security. The distinguished economist, uh, Nicholas Stern, uh, wrote a review in 2005 which estimated that inaction, business as usual, on climate change would be equivalent to losing 5 to 20% of global GDP annually. And the review estimated that the costs of taking action, investing in clean technologies and infrastructure, and so on, are around 1% of GDP a year. In other words, the economic benefits of early action, including through jobs and growth, far outweigh the costs of inaction. And as Stern says, the only growth story is the low carbon growth story. High carbon growth is no longer an option. 
The third problem is energy security. Last year's spike in oil served as a painful reminder of our reliance on imported oil. The oil price swung from less than $40 a barrel to $145 a barrel and back. And what we need is stable and predictable energy pricing. And to achieve that, um, we believe we need to invest in all the potentially viable options. Energy efficiency, carbon capture and storage, uh, nuclear and renewables in order to achieve this. Um, what we have done um, is as follows. In 2008, uh, December of 2008, the EU reached a historic 2020 package. We committed to at least a 20% reduction of greenhouse gases from 1990 levels, 20% of energy consumption from re renewables, and 20% gains in energy efficiency um, uh, by that year. The EU also agreed a major financing package worth around 9 billion euros for funding carbon capture and storage demonstration projects. Um, and our long-term commitment is to reduce emissions by 80% below 1990 levels <coughs> by 2050. Meanwhile, the UK was the first country to make our emissions targets legally binding um, in British law. And our policies, we think, are working. Since 1990, the British economy has grown by 45%, while carbon emissions have gone down by 16% and our environmental sector today is one of the fastest growing parts of the economy. Uh, it employs nearly half a million people, generating over $50 billion worth of revenues and is projected to employ over a million people in the next two decades. Now, that's my home turf. What's happening here in this country? Now, the headlines are good. As you know, President Obama has said that he wants the US to lead the world's response to climate change. He stated his long-term goal for a reduction of US greenhouse gas emissions is 80% by 2050 in line with the European commitment. He's committed to pass federal cap and trade legislation to double the US use of energy from renewables over three years, to improve energy efficiency, to Im implement a smart national power grid and invest in carbon capture and storage. And these are excellent foundations, but there's still a long way to go before we can deliver an international deal. If we're going to get that, the first challenge is to find the necessary political will to do that at a time of global recession. Um, the answer to that is the one I've given to you already, which is that there will never be an easy time to make this move, and it makes economic sense to take action early. Creating a low-carbon eco economy will put some jobs at risk, but will create many others. The second challenge is how to create an equitable global deal which does not allow some countries to escape their obligations. And the answer there we see is to include the emerging economies, China, India, and others, but to do so in a way which reflects their different stages of economic development. All will need to be bound by the outcome, um, and that is what we call a common but differentiated treatment of those involved in the negotiation. We believe that China is moving on climate change, but without American leadership is unlikely to sign up to a binding agreement. So it's welcome that President Obama signaled his intention to lead this debate, and we hope that the United States will be able to harness its remarkable array of technology and R&D, including here in Virginia, to help deliver these solutions in the period ahead. Uh, yesterday, Governor Kane and I signed uh, a memorandum of understanding about uh, cooperation between the UK and the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, in a number of areas to do with uh, the environment and climate change. And I obviously hope that, in its, uh, in its own way, will be a contribution towards the sort of international collaboration which is going to be needed in the months and years ahead. In conclusion, um, Benjamin Franklin said that to succeed, you should jump as quickly at opportunities as you do at conclusions. European publics have already reached their conclusions about the election of President Obama. The opinion polls show massive support for him. And our publics have very large expectations and of a new um, transatlantic relationship. But Richard Haas, the head of the American Council on Foreign Relations, said that opportunity represents possibility, not inevitability. And on both sides of the Atlantic, we need to work out now, in the months ahead, how to turn this possibility into what I would like to see uh, a transforming moment in transatlantic relations. Thank you very much. <laughs>